What's going on? Welcome to Legacy, the true story of the Lakers, recap and review episode three, and you can consider that your spoiler warning. We start off with competing scenes cut together, one of the Lakers still riding high after their championship win, and the other of Dr. Jerry Buss's childhood. See, Dr. Buss grew up broke, and he was raised by a mom who left every night when he was asleep, and a stepfather who made Jerry keep his own biological surname. His stepfather wouldn't adopt him, so his last name remained Buss, the rest of his family uh, was known as Brown. The situation was so bleak that Buss left home at 16 and worked as a bellhop and on the railroad, but Jerry Buss had something else going for him. The man was flat out brilliant. I had a quick aptitude for that kind of thing. It came very easily to me. So I ended up graduating when I was 17. Not only that, he then goes to the University of Wyoming and graduates in two years, and then goes to California where he gets his PhD at USC at the age of 23, but that's not how he got his dough. See, right out of college, Jerry was hired as an aerospace engineer, and he convinced the rest of his colleagues to go in with him on an apartment building. They bought this small Santa Monica apartment building for $130,000, and they multiplied it into a $350 million empire, and this, the crown jewel, the forum. That might seem amazing to you, but not to Jerry. Compared to the complex equations that you have to understand in chemistry, business seemed uh, kind of mundane. The dude had a computer for a brain. You'd go into his office, and he'd have a calculator on his desk. The calculator was for you. In order to keep up with him, you were going to need a calculator. And that computer was working overtime because before you knew it, Dr. Buss had turned that one apartment building into an empire. And he may have been a businessman in his head, but Dr. Buss was a sports fanatic at heart. In fact, if you asked him, he was the biggest sports fan that he'd ever met. And now that he was rich, he had his eyes on one prize, the Los Angeles Lakers. But there was one problem. Jack Kent Cook owned them and... Those of us working for Mr. Cook saw him. He'll never sell. It was his favorite toy. But Jerry Buss had started investing in Las Vegas and Cook did a lot of business there. So Dr. Buss goes full court press and sells himself to Jack Cook for over a year, but nothing happens. That is until one day when Jack calls out the blue and says he's ready to sell the team. But why? Well, it's because he was going through a nasty divorce and the original people's court judge gave Cook's wife $41 million before he took the TV gig. So Jack needed the money fast. So if you wanna know who's really the blame for Buss owning the Lakers? The so now that Cook was ready to make the deal, he had one caveat. He actually didn't want cash. He says, well, you know, I've always liked the Chrysler building in New York. Could you get me that? <laughs> oh, sure. And Jerry Buss is like, okay, and starts liquidating everything to get up the necessary capital. And after cashing out, plus a $3 million loan, he has just enough to buy the Chrysler building. At the time, it was the most complicated transaction ever in NBA history, and Dr. Buss took a moment to soak it all in. I took a portable chair, sat it out in the middle of the basketball court, and leaned back, and I thought, wow, I've really arrived. <laughs> but he couldn't soak for long, because that meant that the buses were cash-strapped and needed their teams to win, and one of them was the Lasers, which was run by Johnny Buss. The team lost games, money, and Johnny lost his nerve. He quit the gig, and Dr. Buss gave the job to his second son, Jim. And that caused friction between them and their sister, Jeannie, who felt like she'd been passed over twice. I looked at those opportunities as things that he didn't think I was capable of doing and I wanted to prove that I could take on any challenge. I mean, in which way did she have the right to take over? By age? No, I was second, so I'm not sure what her basis of complaint would be, but does she have a right to be upset? I, I, don't, I don't think so. And to make matters worse, the Lakers had their own problem, and both of them were over seven feet tall. The Twin Towers, Hakeem Olajuwon and Ralph Sampson. And those two, along with the rest of the Houston Rockets, bounced the Lakers out of the playoffs just before the finals. And to the Lakers, any year that they didn't win the finals was a failure. And it's causing Jerry Buss to think about making changes. And on draft night, word leaks out that James Worthy is on the chopping block and he's blindsided. And what's worse, the news is that his friend Magic Johnson supports the move. Mark McGuire was one of my best friends at that time. So now everybody thought I was driving this trade. And even though he said he didn't, Max was like, well, Coop, you know what? Hey, this is something that they're looking at. What do you think about Mark McGuire? And 
I just said I didn't think that was a move to make. But Worthy wasn't the only one caught off guard. So was Jerry West. And he was so against the deal that he told Jerry Buss that he'd leave the team before letting James Worthy go. And that endorsement was enough to make the Lakers owner back up and the deal fell through. And with Worthy back in the fold, Pat Riley challenged the 86-87 Lakers to have their career best effort. He's like, if we're 1% better across the board, we've got this. And the whole team bought into it. They were dominant. How dominant? Well, the 80s Lakers were iconic for winning, but most people think that the 87 team was their peak. At the end of the season, we won 65 games, and we had come to this point as a team where we matured into a dynasty. They destroyed the competition on their way to meeting the Boston Celtics in the finals, but due to injuries to the Celtics, the Lake Show were the favorites. Magic Johnson skyhooked on Boston and took his squad to another title. We blew them out. And we beat him in, I think, six games, but it was like, really, I mean, we beat him by 20. It wasn't showtime. It was just, it was greatness. And Riley wasn't afraid to show it. At the press conference after the big win, he guarantees a repeat. And I'm guaranteeing everybody here, next year, we're going to win it again. And even though it made the players mad, even then, Pat Riley had a plan. See, when the Lakers won the title in 72, they lost it the next year. Same thing in 1980, 82, and 85. Riley's guarantee set the expectation to make next year different, but the team just wanted to catch their breath. We've exhaled four times, guys. And guess what? Every year we came back and lost, so I'm gonna make you own your greatness. But you know who might need a breather? Jerry Buss, because Black Monday hit the stock market and rocked his wallet. He was leveraged up to his eyeballs in real estate, and due to the dip, he might have to sell everything. But Jerry Buss wasn't ready to share that truth with the rest of the world just yet. Are you in any way, shape, or form in financial trouble? No, I am not. I am solvent. Uh, the Lakers are fine. They're but once again, back against the wall must be Buss's favorite thinking position because he comes up with two ideas that absolutely change the game. First, he sells the naming rights to the forum, making it the Great Western Forum, a first for the league. And then he follows up with creating his own cable station. At first, the other owners thought it was insane because if you aired your home games, you'd lose money. But Dr. Buss saw it another way. And he said, no, Jeannie, you have to think about how many games do we sell out? And I said, all of them. By broadcasting the games, we increase the size of the forum. These two moves solved the problem, and now the Lakers were ready to turn their attention back to basketball. And Pat Riley turned his attention back to everything, driving his team mad until they got to the finals where they met Isaiah Thomas and the Pistons. And the series was back and forth until game six where Isaiah Thomas was cooking. That is, until he got hurt. And he doesn't let that stop him, though. He actually goes back on the court and drops 43 points, but it wasn't enough. I don't care who it is. If my mother out there, I'm, I'm going to win. And that's what he does, leading his team to the win and a pivotal game seven. A game that Isaiah Thomas will miss because that ankle isn't getting better. And without him, the Pistons don't stand a chance. James Worthy goes off and the Lakers go off with the title. Pat Riley's challenge was met and the Lakers are now ecstatic. To go from nearly losing the team to winning back to back was a historic feat. And this time at the title parade, the team took extra precautions against any more Pat Riley guarantees. But it was obviously on everyone's mind, even if they didn't have the words for it just yet. Three, repeat. Three, repeat. Three, repeat. But by the start of next season, they did because that was their rallying cry. They wanted the three-peat, and nobody wanted it more than Pat Riley. And his team played like it because they dominated the regular season. And at the end of the streak, once again, the Pistons lay waiting. But Pat Riley wasn't waiting. He decided to use that time to run his team ragged. This is pure torture. My body is killing me. And maybe he pushed too hard because right before the finals were set to begin, Byron Scott got injured in practice at the very last minute. With Byron Scott done, the Lakers' chances were gone for a three-peat, and the Pistons were all out of sympathy because of last year. So they went and crushed the Lake show and took their first NBA title. It was a hard pill to swallow, and the blame fell at the feet of Pat Riley and his training style. The episode ends, though, with the unapologetic Pat Riley making a stunning admission. But that definitely was, was the beginning, was the beginning of the end for me. 
but it's not the end for me though, because this series has done nothing but deliver the goods. I was interested to see how they would handle the rifts between the bus children, and they definitely took it there. Plus, what we learned about Pat Riley was worth the hour by itself. Episode 3 keeps the recommendation train rolling, and I can't wait for episode 4, but that's my opinion. What's yours? Speak your mind in the comments, and thanks for watching Hoops and Dreams. If you dig the vibe, hit the subscribe to join the tribe. Peace.